basically because I'm building an institution right now, that's um, what I'm thinking about mostly is the institutional barriers and um, paradigms and incentive structures that have um, that have made it very difficult for me to do the kinds of things that I, I think need to be done. Um, so I've I've been in academia, I've been a PhD student, um, I've been in industry, and I've had um, a really horrible time in both. I have faced a lot of um, issues in both, and um, I've just felt like um, I haven't been able to do the kind of work that I, I want to do in, in any of these places. And I want to talk a little bit about the incentive structures that make it like that. Um, so uh, Karen Howe, who used to be um, at the MIT Tech Review um, and is now at, I guess, at the Wall Street Journal said, you know, when a company like Google or Microsoft or OpenAI builds these huge models, right, so that they are benevolent tech dictators, get to exclusively decide what kind of problems they want their models to tackle, it does not make the world a more equitable place. Um, on top of that, name one technology in history that has successfully been redistributed completely equitably from the bastions of privilege and power to the have-nots. We have yet to achieve this with even the most basic resources like water, paper, electricity, or the internet. And AI, um, in quotes, is, is not different, right? So the whole history of AI is basically um, the government in um, conjunction with elite institutions, whether it's MIT or Stanford, pumping money into technology or quote unquote AI when it's um, interested in warfare um, and it, whether it is you know machine translation um, and the Cold War or self-driving cars and DARPA um, or the dancing robots that we see that are now like um, deployed at the border, it's always been um, to expand empire and to police people and borders. And um, so, for instance, this is um, a paper by Amanda um, on machine translation. It's called uh, Machine Translation Shifts Power. And I found this quote, um, well, very true, right? Like the most important thing happening in Silicon Valley right now is not disruption. Rather, it's institution building and the consolidation of power on a scale and at a pace that are both probably unprecedented in human history. Um, and um, again, Karen Howe, like today on my talk, I'm gonna talk about a lot of Karen, Karen Howe's work. Uh, she has this um, series uh, on um, AI, what she calls AI colonialism. And so artificial intelligence creating a new colonial uh, world, world order. Um, so, whether it is social media platforms or large language models, um, for which I wrote, I, I wrote a paper about large language models and got fired, um, or other deep learning based systems, the rush to build and proliferate is predicated on the belief that automation makes startups and co companies lots of profit, right? And um, if I argue that if they weren't able to exploit workers so much, they wouldn't even have uh, their market calculation even would, wouldn't make sense, right? They wouldn't think that they would make profit by building lots and lots of um, huge models that need um, data sets that are labeled by right now crowd workers or other people that they exploit. For instance, um, Karen's um, uh, article, one of them uh, discusses um, how they exploit um, catastrophe. Uh, for instance, in Venezuela, when there was um, the economic collapse, they advertised a lot of these labeling um, kind of service of, I mean, jobs for which they hired um, very, very low wage workers and surveilled them. Um, you know, like Sito was talking about workplace surveillance. Um, and there was this other article recently. This one is close to my heart because, um, so this is an article about um, content moderators uh, that were working um, for a company called Sama, which is a third um, party contractor uh, for Facebook, right, or Meta. And a lot of times this is kind of how they, uh, con they, they exploit people, right? So they, they're not necessarily, they're not generally full-time employees or even contractors for the company. They're um, hired through a third party. And um, this was a, um, a an office in Kenya 
but uh, it was um, a lot of different people from uh, different African countries. So, for instance, here is Daniel. And this um, office was full of content moderators. Um, for instance, eight Ethiopian content moderators um, resigned within one, uh, in one week. And that's because there is currently a genocide in Ethiopia in the northern state of Tigray. And there's lots of other um, violence and other issues that are happening all over the country. And uh, what's happening on social media is playing a really horrible um, impact by amplifying all of this. And so in addition to all of these people being harmed by the current violence that is going on, um, and being the end working as content moderators, they're then um, paid like literally five thousand dollars a month, a year, a year. Um, they were tracked. Like for instance, they had to make decisions about uh, a video uh, whether it should it should uh, be uploaded or whether it has um, violated any of their policies within like fifteen seconds. So they would track their eyes and things like that. Um, they did not have any sort of um, um, support for their mental health. And then when they tried to unionize, they um, fired. Um, so this guy, Daniel, was the person who was leading the unionization effort, and they fired him. So um, again, so a lot of these companies need a lot of labeled data or moderation or something, and that's how they're able to just scale. The reason they're able to scale really fast is because they're not you know, appropriately compensating people what they should, and they're able to just exploit people and break laws really um, easily. Um, so I think if even if we focused on the label exploitation part, I feel like they, these um, companies wouldn't be able to um, scale these systems so fast. Um, so anyhow, I think that, you know, this paradigm of, of AI that has existed is, is always about kind of labor exploitation or warfare or maximizing profit. And I feel like we need a different paradigm if we want to create tools that benefit us. Um, so and the, uh, some examples of different paradigms that I've seen that were really inspiring to me are again in this um, uh, series, that, um, that AI colonialism series that um, Karen talked about. And I've also talked to um, some of these people. So this example is from the Teiku Media in um, New Zealand uh, who wanted to work on language revitalization, um, of, of Maori language revitalization. And so in 2018, staff um, people at Teiku Media had, um, they created this competition to uh, have people send them data, uh, labeled data, so with the, with the speech and also like a transcription, so that they could create um, kind of a speech transcription or other language technology that could then help them revitalize their language, have younger people learn their language, et cetera, et cetera. So when they did this, it was um, very, very popular. They had, I believe, uh, I don't know if I have it in the slides, over 400 or uh, 500 hours of, um, of uh, labeled data. Oh, 300 hours, yeah, of annotated audio. And so then, so this was enough for them to start working on their um, language um, tech uh, work. So, but what happened is after they uh, created this, this data set, um, they had an offer from a company called Landbridge um, to license their data um, or sell their data. And they said no, and they published their rejection along with a video explaining why. Um, and they said, you know, why would we want to sell this to an American company? They um, our you know colonizers basically suppressed our languages. They physically beat it our, out of our grandparents, and now they want us. They want to sell our language back to us as a service. Um, and so they said that you know for them, data is the final frontier for colonization, and it's kind of the same thing um, that's happening in Africa too, right? The raw materials in other. Um, kind of uh, in anything else, you know, they take the raw materials almost for free and then sell it back to the continent for, you know, orders and orders of magnitude. And this is a similar thing here. Um, this happens a lot of places. Like I just very recently, right after I saw, um, I gave a talk, I also saw this example 
of um, of this um, this uh, organization uh, that was working in um, in Standing Rock uh, that was called the Le Le is it the Lakota Language Consortium, and basically they banned them because of their again unethical exploitative practices, exploiting um, indigenous language speakers, and doing this research for their own gain when the people are not getting anything out of it. Um, so some organizations that I've seen that are combating the, these uh, this kind of exploitative research practice are, for instance, Masakani, um, which is a grassroots NLP community um, for Africans by Africans. Um, and like I mentioned, the example of the Tehiku media. And so um, because I, for me, found it very difficult to operate in, in um, any kind of environment, whether it's academia or industry, I wanted to create a, an, a, an, ind um, an independent, well, I can't call it independent, as independent as possible, a research institute where um, we could um, work on our own um, research and have and think about different um, kinds of research practices that um, hopefully are not exploitative. So for instance, um, so what are our values? We say, okay, community, not exploitation. So DARE is distributed around the world, primarily um, in the US, in Africa, and um, in Europe. Um, and, um, and a couple of countries in Europe. And so first, uh, community, not exploitation. So we want people to not do parachute research. We want people to focus on the communities that they're from, um, that they're in. Um, and so we want the people who are getting the fame and fortune for research to be of the, the research community. So I, I'm personally interested in removing the barrier between the researched and the researcher. Um, thriving researchers, because in academia, um, I see I had to publish like every every month or whatever to survive, and I don't see how you can do anything that um, is useful to our communities if you're doing that. So we don't want to um, kind of just pump out papers. We want to focus on, for instance, um, Catherine was talking about um, communicating or visualizations um, or kind of communicating your research in a way that reaches uh, different groups of people who should be engaged in your research rather than just like random plots and, and papers. And so for me, I, I would like to take that seriously. Um, Comprehensive and principle processes. So if we're going to be, if we can be slow, then we can be more deliberate about our research process. And finally, I mean, proactive, pragmatic. So what this means is that you know, if I'm in a computer science department, um, for example, and I'm working on quote unquote AI or computer vision, I have to start from the assumption that this field has to exist, like this kind of paradigm has to exist. But if I'm in a different environment, I don't have to start from the assumption that this AI even has to exist, right? Or a specific kind of technology has to exist. So we can do the kind of, I guess, refusal that um, um, Amsita was talking about. So um, for me, that's why I wanted, I needed to be in a, in a different kind of environment where um, this was the case. And so now we have to also be very um, thoughtful about our funding. So if your funding comes from just, you know, either DARPA or Google, it's inevitable that our um, research has to have to do something with either the military or you know, um, maximizing profit from some corporation. And, you know, and then people talk about AI for social good, but if your entire paradigm and goals start from something to do with the military, it's, it's kind of like creating a tank first, you know, and then you think about tanks for social good. Like, you know, how are we going to retrofit that tank to do agriculture, right? So my, my question is then why don't we just create something different entirely or don't create a tank rather than trying to retrofit the tank for social good? And I felt like it wasn't, um, it was very difficult to, to think about that kind of mindset um, in any of the other um, organizations I've been in. Um, I want to give a little bit of intro we, of, of who's in DARE. Um, we have Safia Noble and Shira, our, our advisory committee. Safia, I mean, a lot of people here probably know her. You know, she wrote Algorithms of, of Oppression. She's a, a very well-known scholar. And Shira is um, in Kenya. He um, kind of, uh, so they, to me, they, they um, represent two prongs of what we're trying to do. When we see harms, 
uh, technological harms. We want to uncover them without, you know, reservation or worry, being worried about retaliation of some sort. And then if we want to build any type of technology, we want to do it in a way that we think benefits um, people in our community. So Shira works a lot on um, analyzing climate change, bird migration patterns, um, food security, et cetera, um, and, uh, you know, using uh, data science. Um, we have some research fellows that I want to introduce you to, for instance, um, when I say like, for example, um, breaking down this kind of uh, difference between the researcher and the researched. Um, so like Meron, Meron Stefanos is a, is a refugee advocate. Um, she has um, helped more than 16,000 refugees um, who were in human trafficked, etc. cetera. Um, she has a, a very harrowing um, documentary called Sound of Torture. But, and she's also a victim of, let's say, harassment on social media. Like just the other day, she was harassed by, um, she's Eritrean, um, Swedish, uh, pro-Eritrean government, you know, people in the supermarket physically trying to attack her. Now, when you think about all the people who, who I guess, make their name studying refugees or studying social media harms or something like that, they're generally not the victims, right? They're generally either not the refugees themselves or the people who are very well known in that community. So what I'm interested in is making sure that that, kind, that is not what happens in our research. I'd like Meron to be the one who gets the fame and fortune for doing the kind of research that impacts um, her and her community. Um, so another example I want to give is Raseja. So Raseja is, um, yeah, I just mentioned it already. She is um, an, another research fellow. She was born and raised in um, South Africa. She was born and raised in, um, in a township. And um, a project that we worked on that's near and dear to her heart, um, along with um, Nyaling Luzango and Richard, um, is this um, analyzing um, spatial apartheid um, using um, computer vision methods. So. If you look at this image on the right, you see, um, you know, um, townships, and on the left, you see um, suburbs, and this is a, a result of spatial apartheid, right, uh, apartheid in South Africa that was mandated, saying that, um, you know, uh, white people can live in these uh, neighborhoods uh, with huge budgets attached to them, and, and everybody else lives in these um, townships. But this is now, this, this picture is now, you know, like post, way post apartheid when it's supposed to be over. So the question is, can you can we analyze the evolution of um, of these um, neighborhoods um, uh, using computer vision methodology? Um, I'm not going to discuss just um, <laughs> I'm not going to discuss um, it more, but just this is the kind of kind of project we're working on. And one of the things we're going to argue um, is that you know the South African government. Um, in the census data, so I guess, um, yeah, Catherine, you mentioned the library of myth missing data sets, right? In the census data, the South African government lumps townships with, um, with um, suburbs, and uh, which makes it impossible to study the, the, um, the effect of spatial apartheid, because townships were created because of apartheid. So if you just lump them in with suburbs, you're sort of pretending that they don't exist anymore, right? You can't study the effect of apartheid if you're just not, if you're not tracking um, townships on their own. So um, we had to label townships. And so the argument that we're going to make um, to the government is that they should um, not lump townships along with suburbs in the, in the census. They should stop doing that and break out townships um, on their own. Now, um, so if you're interested, um, here is a paper on this project, but this is an example of what I meant by um, saying that it is, to me, impossible to do this kind of work. Um, if I were in an, um, you know, let's say the computer science department or the computer vision department in, in, acti um, in an academic institution or, or like even, you know, a, a, in, in, um, uh, in industry. So when we were trying to publish this work, I mean, it was just like, you know, either it took us years to get the, to even, you know, gather the data set and do it the right way and make sure we, you know, involve the right people, et cetera. Right. And you want to publish it in a computer um, science venue. They'll be like, oh, but this is just a data set issue. Where's the algorithm is, you know, is it generalizable, blah, blah, blah. Right. And so let's say I want to, you know, 
recruit students, get tenure. My students have to have papers and these kinds of venues. If I want to get tenure, I have to get people interested in the issues that are <laughs> in, you know, South African apartheid, right? Um, and so to me, this was why I wanted to kind of experiment with creating a new institute where at least, you know, we can um, define our measures of success and we can think through the kinds of um, founding sources and other kind of research practices that um, we're having. And with that, I will stop there. Thank you. My assistant is still sleeping, so I, I, I don't know if we can um, have them for Q&A. <laughs>